I'm going to talk to you about the current state of hobbyist metal detecting. And this is a term that's used quite readily and it was chosen as part of the research that was done, which I'm going to show you the results of. Um, I'll give you a little background about me. I, I moved to Scotland about eight years ago. I was quite shocked about the, this metal detecting that's going on in all these archaeological sites, which I'd never seen in Ireland before. I thought this isn't regulated. And, but I quickly got to know uh, the system and actually it's part of a lot of the projects that we deal with now, even at the moment we've just finished a major metal detecting survey um, using similar methods to what you've, you talked about earlier, Vicky. And it's done alongside uh, 8 to 10 percent valuation of trial trenches plus field walking, then excavation and whatever follows after that. Um, I've worked on quite a few battlefield sites over the last seven or eight years and some of them we did them professionally, if you like, with our own staff with metal detectors, and others we've utilised uh, local metal detectors, metal detecting clubs and societies. Um, so I'll give you a little uh, rundown of how I'm going to uh, get the message across to you today. I'll give you a background on the company and some of the projects we've done, and a lot of you will recognise the, the names of the battlefields and the programmes that we've been involved with. Um, a background to the actual research that we did at, um, with uh, the Treasure Trove Unit and Historic Environment Scotland in 2016. The results of the research, um, and I'll give you some case studies of uh, some of the successful uh, projects that were done using obvious metal detecting as part of archaeological projects, mainly battlefields. Um, come to some conclusions and then talk about where, where do we go from here. Um, I used to sit on a CIFA committee in Scotland and we talked about introducing some sort of standards and guidance for metal detecting surveys, but not necessarily aimed at hobbyist metal detecting, but within the profession itself and within units, that there needs to be a standardised way of, of doing things and people need to know how to use the machines in the first instance. Um, so and we can't really manage hobbyist metal detectors if we don't really know what we're doing ourselves. So here's some of the investigations that we've been involved with over the last seven, eight years. Um, we worked on the, the Great Escape site in Poland, the Channel 4, Bannockburn 700 is probably the largest project and most recent. There was over a thousand volunteers we had for that and some of them were metal detectors. Um, uh, that'll be one of the case studies I'll talk about later. Kelly Cranky, probably the best preserved battlefield in Scotland for sure. Um, it's virtually untouched, really, apart from the massive carriageway that goes across the middle of it. Um, Stirling Bridge, Culloden, some, some of these names I'm sure are very familiar to anyone who's, who's interested in battlefields. And if you want to check out more, you can go onto <coughs> our, our website and check out some of the other work that we've done besides what I've mentioned here. So the research that we carried out, uh, we were commissioned by HES and, and Treasure Trove um, to conduct this this. Uh, research and um, from the outset we had to ensure that we had a, a robust reference group um, which was stand up to scrutiny because the first thing people say well who came up with these questions and who did you ask and who told you to ask them and so we had um, one leader of a metal detecting group the largest metal detecting group in Scotland still is I think um, with a leader of another UK-wide organisation, metal detecting. Um, you might even be here today, I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not going to mention their names because the whole point of this was as anonymous throughout. Um, we also had someone from Treasure Trove who also had a, a PhD in um, a battlefield, a metal detecting related uh, subject. Um, we had the second largest landowner in Scotland was involved in it. Um, Someone from HES who had battlefield experience and metal detecting experience, and a council archaeologist um, who had some direct interactions with metal detectors and positive and negative experiences, and, and myself. So we, we covered the whole, the whole board. There was another researcher actually as well who had done previous research, research in metal detecting across the UK, a similar assessment to this, but um, more England and Wales. And, so they just touched on Scotland, so this was filling a gap. So um, these abbreviations I'm going to use throughout, um, it's just a bit less wordy uh, that way. Um, if you'd like to download a copy of this, it's, um, it was published in 2016, it's on the, 
Historic Environment Scotland website. Um, you see all the, the data. A lot of stuff's redacted, um, obviously for anonymity, and, um, but all the information's there, all the data's there. And I'm just going to summarise the results of this today. So we contacted all council archaeologists in Scotland and we got a response from all of them, be it from an email, phone call, some of them were face to face as well. Um, some of the main museums, we tried to get geographical coverage, not every single tiny little museum was contacted, but museums that we knew had interactions with metal detecting activity. Um, main metal detecting clubs and groups, um, the, some individual contacts, metal detector contacts that we had established already through our battlefield work at Bannockburn and other sites. Um, an online version for those who didn't want that sort of face-to-face -face or on-the-phone interaction and just wanted from a distance, maybe found it easier to um, say what they really thought through an online response, um, which was very productive. Um, and we also used the treasure trove data, which recorded uh, allocations of, sorry, find, what's the word I'm looking for, recorded finds um, from 1912 through to 2015 just so we had a baseline to work from to see how we could compare that data. Um, I would just note that although uh, a, a treasure trove case might be noted as one, um, that one could be a thousand finds or it could be one find. So if you see numbers and you think, oh, it's not very high, it could actually potentially be high if you have a hoard of a few hundred coins and it's just one, it's one treasure trove case. Um, as you know, the treasure trove system is different to the system in England and Wales where um, everything is considered, um, it's mandatory to report everything that's found, not just the shiny things that metal detectors like. Um, so here's um, the first metal detecting find, the one that's first specifically noted as a metal detecting find is in 1981, which is a little bit behind England, which was sometime in the 70s as far as I remember. Um, so you can see a few little dips and hollows, and I've just made a note that 1999 and 2000 is probably due to the foot and mouth outbreak, so restrictions on land access, um, and then 9 and 10 was the quite severe winters that were felt, not just in Scotland, but across the UK actually. Um, and this next one, the two main uh, detecting clubs in Scotland, Detecting Scotland and Toddy's Digs, um, both started in 10 and 11 and you can just see things just shut off after that really and there's more and more people doing it there's more re more reported uh, finds as well um, but they're not all being reported and that's part of the problem and that's one of the reasons why we're doing this research so this map just plots some of the hot spots if you like and um, for those of you who aren't familiar with some of the regions in Scotland hopefully you can you can read down the side, um, but the main, the main hot spots are the agricultural areas, like the, rest, the Scottish borders, this is Fife, this is Fife and Ross. Um, although the Highland is a, it's the biggest area and it's nice and bright orange, um, probably the metal detecting is um, concentrated on a few small areas within there, from the northeast and around the, um, Inverness. So it's not a blanket coverage of metal detecting, so this graphic maybe suggests that, but that's not the case. Um, so that this shows you the spread of the treasure trove cases reported and um, with the highest levels being in the arable farming areas where it's more accessible and nice to dig for if you're metal detecting it's nice and easy and um, nice so open land usually quite flat or undulating so it's um, easy to get large numbers of people on there to detect um, so this this just shows a little run on how things have increased quite quite extensively even in that five year period from 10 to 15 and it shows the number of cases um, the relative increase in some of the areas and um, it's really it's quite stark really um, so this, this is from, from Greece and Galloway just down here um, that, that's also seen quite an increase on and off over the over the years so the, the estimated number of um, HMDs in, in Scotland is quite low in comparison to England, where you probably have pro probably well in the, to the thousands, maybe maybe tens of thousands of people. So it's not quite as prolific, um, although 
population wise it's probably similar similar levels um, so we used previous research done by Susie Thomas and um, I'm sure some of you know of the work that she's done she's um, currently based in Helsinki but she's in, in done a lot of research over the years um, on net detecting and uh, illicit antiquity dealing and all sorts um, so we were able to compare our data alongside hers and using this 39.8 percent of detectors uh, we were able to work out a, a rough estimate of what we thought the actual figure for detectors in Scotland is, so 520. If you look at online forums, you'll come up with a figure of, of about 3,500. Um, most of those people don't actually do metal detecting. Um, and the, the ones who actually have insurance through NCMD is a more realistic um, number. Uh, and the people who do it individually in uh, little small groups won't bother with insurance, and that makes up the numbers to bring us up to that figure of 520. Um, breakdown of age really just to, I noted on the previous slide that it's usually older older men mostly and there's only 11% of females represented in the, the survey um, which is quite low and um, so it's generally a male dominated older male with maybe some more time in their hands um, that's doing this. So some of the negatives, I need to give I give, need to give negatives and positives. I could come and say all the nice things about detecting and all the all the positives, but I, I wouldn't be painting the right picture if that was the case. I, I thought the most shocking thing for me was that only one from 166 people who responded online said that they actually record all of their finds using GPS. So the rest are just using their phone and picking the shiny things and noting where they are, but discarding the other, you know, how many hundreds of pieces of iron or other objects in a, a hedge somewhere, which is usually what we find when we go to a site. And so all that potential data, irrespective of what period it's from, is, is lost. It's of no use to anyone anymore. Um, tourism was another thing that was quite shocking, where people were offering uh, trips to scheduled monuments in the north of Scotland. Come along, come across the Atlantic, uh, we'll take you there, we'll show you some sites. And, and in fact, there was evidence that the same people who were doing this were actually seeding the site as well. So they knew these people would find something and then come back again and again. So it's quite a, a money-making scheme. So obviously there's evidence of scheduled monuments being targeted. Lots of anecdo anecdotal evidence from council archaeologists and local museum representatives. And, um, there's a real bad lack of engagement between uh, heritage professionals and detectors across most of Scotland with only a few exceptions um, and lack of reporting and a, a real lack of appreciation of what can happen to an artefact if it's not recovered um, as sensitively as it should be. Um, so in some areas um, where there's no engagement, which is most areas, um, the heritage professionals are generally quite um, quite damning of metal detecting, but they, they don't know, they don't have that first uh, first-hand interaction with them, so how can they know? So they're just you know using the same old phrases and oh, what's bad and um, it can't ever be a good thing and I don't know what they're finding. No one tells me anything, but um, but they're not actually going out and actively trying to engage with metal detectors, so they're not, not really helping themselves. Um, but one of the heritage professionals, um, the same one actually thought this was a witch hunt. This research until I told him what the reference. The reference panel was made up of, and the fact that we were, you know, including everyone in this process, and um, that he was the same person that made this positive uh, statement. Uh, he thought it was, on the whole, a positive thing. Um, well, one one other heritage professional, actually, who had been engaging with metal detectors for about twenty years, said, "Oh, I don't see any real increase in metal detecting. It's just the same as being like that for about twenty years." But that same area, um, from this research. And there's a 14-fold increase in metal detecting in that area. So even that person that's engaging with the metal detecting is oblivious to what's actually going on. That's, that's not good. Um, so, yeah, there's some, some positives from the heritage professionals. Um, it's given us new information, new finds. Um, the museums in particular, it, it's a win-win for them. They get nice artifacts. It's adding, you know, adding to their collections and it's drawing more people in. It's uh, increasing local interest, so they're, they're getting probably more positive than anyone out of the whole process. Um, 
and the potential for exchange of knowledge and skills, of course. So just some of the facts and figures of things. Um, 88% of HMDs said they, they, would uh, they would heed advice, you know, if they were advised to avoid sensitive areas, they would, they would heed that, and that's reassuring. Um, almost 7 out of 10 for the experience of working with heritage professionals. Um, some, some of the metal detectors actually thought, yes, there are positives, but there are negatives as well, so they're, they're quite, open, they're quite um, open to the idea, um, but it's not all positive. And some note that there is a need for regulation. Um, one of the case studies, this is a major collaborative, this is, these are all the collaborators really, the people that were involved in the project, including the metal detecting groups, uh, um, with which the, the, the survey couldn't have been done without them, and they're an important part of the project, as much as anyone else in this list is. Um, we were able to cover large areas of the parts of the Battle of Bannockburn, um, and we found a few key artefacts from that, um, three artefacts more than there were from the battle prior to doing the survey, so we've got a few medieval objects which people were quite excited about at the time. Um, Killy Cranky, um, we used metal detecting groups here, two different clubs we used, Detecting Scotland and Scottish Artefact Recovery Group, with which Toddy used to be a member and then he started his own club in 2011. Um, so we couldn't cover the areas as quickly and as efficiently and as cost effectively without the use of metal detectors for something of this scale. Um, and this is some of the results filtered out some of the 18th and 19th century material that we recovered. Was, the, the finds were in the hundreds, but we've whittled it down to things that could be attributed to late 17th century. Some of the munitions and buttons. Um, And what, what that was able to tell us as well, and uh, we were able to match up some of the accounts of the battle with the actual findings and the distributions of, of the munitions, which is, which is great and doesn't very often happen. Um, so in conclusion, that there, is, there is no consistent uh, approach in my experience in working with hundreds of metal detectors over the last seven or eight years. Um, herding cats, I think is what a common phrase. Um, and so we're doing the surveys, and when they're working with us, and we're setting out transects, that works well. And um, although we always had to have at least one person for every ten metal detectors to ensure <coughs> that everything's being done appropriately. And um, the reason for that is a pretty bad experience I had on one of the projects I was doing, where we we found out that someone had actually seeded something, and then tried to make out they'd find it, and it was quite a significant find, which then wasn't significant. Um, so it's very important that we knew that everything was being done properly, so it has to be supervised, not just off you go and bring back your fines later sort of thing. Um, we need, things need to be verified. Um, there's no consistent or sustained engagement between the HMDs and HPs, and that, that needs to change. Um, where it is happen happening, that things are better. Um, it's not perfect, but um, mo more of it needs to happen. You know. Mutual respect needs to be there as well. Um, we shouldn't just be so dismissive of each other, and that works both ways. Um, but the more we work together, the less that's going to happen. So where do we go from here? Um, as we all know, we need appropriate standards um, and, and guidance. We need uh, strong methodologies that everyone adheres to. If we're not all doing it the same way, how can we compare the data? But the metal detectors also need to be doing this, and it's no use us doing it with metal detectors if the metal detectors aren't also doing that. And so, um, if we all work together and work in the same direction, then it's, it's going to lead to a, a much greater benefit to all of us and to the archaeology as well. Let's speak.